right. Good to see you today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this day that we can come and sing these praises to you and that now we can open your word. Oh, Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would fall on this place with might and power and authority. I pray that we would surrender to you. We would listen with spiritual ears to see what does the God of the universe want to say to me individually today and to us corporately. And that we'd not be hearers only, but we would be doers today, that we would hear what you're saying and we would respond. God, as we pray for sister churches, I pray for First Baptist and T. Harris today as they're searching for a pastor and just pray that you would move with your might and spirit there today, equip them, use them, Lord, there in that community. And now, God, please get great glory through the way that we hear and respond to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in the book of Jonah again this morning. We're in Jonah chapter 1 in verses 5 through 10. Jonah chapter 1, verses 5 through 10 today. Many of you have had the experience where you have more than one child sharing a bedroom and they won't stop talking, go to sleep in their room. Some of you haven't had that experience, but you can picture it. In our house, of course, we have had that experience uh, over the years. Many times uh, at its height, we had four boys in one room and three girls in another room. And I won't tell you which of those rooms this following illustration uh, has to do with. (laughs) However, this could be a little tip. We picked this up from someone years ago for those of you who are young parents. And and by the way, we're thankful for our young parents. And just a, a note, I've said this before, your children are always welcome here. Any age, it's okay if they make a little noise. Noise means we're alive. And uh, so they're just always welcome. We have so many options for you. If you need a break, if your kids need a break, but they're just always welcome here, so know that. But anyway, you know, you, you, you've got that chronic night, and tonight's the night that they just need to stop talking. So you go in, lights are off, guys or girls, whichever one this happens to be about, it's time to stop talking. You shut the door, but you're still in there. Because you know what happens when you shut the door. That's when they start back up again. And it, if for no other reason, do this for the sheer, the sheer joy of surprising them. <laughs> I mean, imagine you're a child and, and dad's just said good night again and the door shuts and you start to talk and you hear dad's voice. I mean, it's great. It's a wonderful thing. Even if, it doesn't, even if it doesn't accomplish its purpose, it's fun just to surprise them there in their bed. Well, anyway... What does that have to do with anything? There is a point here. Stay with me. We're studying this somewhat, at this point, miserable story of Jonah. And we're studying it as if we can't relate, right? Jonah, I can't believe you. That Jonah, what a guy. But we can relate. And today, I want you to see and want me to see again, you cannot hide from God. And that's a good thing. Let's read these verses, Jonah 1, 5 through 10. Actually, let's start back with 4. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. Pausing here, if you're, if you're new with us with the story of Jonah, God has spoken to Jonah, his prophet. He says, you need to rise up and go to Nineveh, cry out against them, for their wickedness has come up before me. We learn later in the story, Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh, not because he's so scared of them, although they were a ruthless, horrible people. They're the ones that are already beginning to torment Jonah's people, Israel, and not too long out, God's going to use them to take Israel into captivity, to defeat them. <laughs> so, But that's not the reason we learn later that Jonah doesn't want to go because he knows they'll listen. He doesn't want them to get God's mercy. We looked at that last week. But so here he is. So Jonah has gone down, 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 down. He went down to Joppa, bought a ticket going the opposite way, and he went down into the ship. And now we're learning in this today's story, he's gone down into the bottom of the ship to go to sleep. So here's Jonah. The Lord hurls a great wind upon the sea. It says the ship's about to break up. So 
in verse 5. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God. And they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laid down, and fallen sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you're sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots so that we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And then they said to him, Tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord God of heaven, who has made the sea and the dry land. And then the men became extremely frightened, and they said to him, How could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. When we flee from God, or try to, the first person it affects, and these are not necessarily in order except for an order of the text, it affects us. Now here's Jonah. He doesn't want to go. He buys a ticket. He's going to get away from God. He's going to get away from Nineveh. He goes down into the bottom of the ship, and he's asleep. Jonah's going down, 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 down. But the Lord promises us in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation has overtaken us, but such as is common to man. And the Lord who is faithful with the temptation will provide a way of escape. Now, Jonah is, is fleeing in a way that none of us have ever exactly had to flee. No, God's never called us to go to Nineveh and, and so forth. But you and I, we flee from God. Whether it's with our feet like Jonah is doing here or with our hearts, our minds, many, many ways we flee. But God is faithful that with that temptation that we all struggle against, He will provide a way of escape. Now, it may be fleeing from God because of a message. Maybe God's called you to, to missions or, or to vocational ministry or to serve in the church in some way, and you're fleeing from that. But maybe you're fleeing is that you're fleeing God's truths in your life. Maybe it's immorality. Maybe it's something with our mouths. Maybe it's in our heart. And God says at every moment, even though like Jonah you're going down, 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 you can still turn around. Now, as we're going to learn with Jonah's story as we go on, the further you go away, the harder it gets. The further you go away, the more regret there is, the more baggage there is to clean up. But even at the very depths, as we'll see next week, you can always turn back to the Lord, always. And it's always worth it because what does the devil do? The devil says, you've already taken two steps away from God. It's not worth it. Why? Because we learn in John 10, 10, he wants your destruction. The thief comes, Jesus said, to steal, steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's his plan for you. And so he lies to you and says, oh, it's just not worth it. You might as well go ahead and keep on fleeing. You might as well go ahead and commit the sin now because you've already thought about committing it. And God says, no matter how far you've gone, it's still worth it to turn around at that point. You'll still save yourself regret. You'll still save yourself from the pain and the misery to another degree of going away from God. Turn back today. Now, that way of escape, I've found many times, is found about like that, which means we have to think through what we're going to do in the temptation with God before the temptation comes. When you start going back and forth with the devil about whether you should obey God or the devil, you're pretty much sunk. You still turn back, but it gets really hard really fast. So you have to decide what you're going to do. What is the temptation? What is the sin that so easily entangles you? Where is the place that you so easily fall? And we lie to ourselves with the devil's help. It really doesn't matter. It's, God doesn't care, really. Does God really care that much about me? Does God really care that much about whether I obey him or not? I mean, it's Sandia Baptist Church, this big room full of people. Does God really mind if I don't follow him? I mean, there's a lot. I mean, we probably have a good percentage that follow him. I mean, baseball players, you hit 300, 30%. That's good. So maybe we've got 30% here in God and say, that's good. Look at Jonah. Of all that God has to do in the world, and he does it all simultaneously, fortunately for us, 
Do you think God cared about whether Jonah was obeying him or not? I'd say so. He hurled a wind against the ship and he's about to break it up. God pursued Jonah as far as Jonah wanted to go and he pursues you and he pursues me. Now some in this room have never come to know Christ as, as your Savior. And he's pursuing you. You're here today. Not by accident. But you're here today to hear that you don't just need to be religious. You don't just need to believe there's a God. You need to do as Brent gave us an example this morning in his baptism. The baptism was the after effect of what happened in his heart and what happened in so many of our hearts that we've come to know Christ personally as our Savior. So God's pursuing you, but if you know Christ as your Savior and you say, it really doesn't matter, I'm just going to be kind of a a so-so Christian. They like folks to come down there at Sandia Baptist, so I'll, I'll do that. I'll come. And that's why you keep feeling that, God pursuing you, pursuing you. He's hunting you down like he did Jonah because he loves you because he can't stop loving you, and he can't stop pursuing you. God's on mission here, and he wants Jonah to be a part of his mission. God could do it without Jonah. God could do it without you. God could do it without me. But it's this important to God that you and I say yes to his mission. So running from God affects you, but there's someone else that it affects everyone else around you. We pick back up at the story here in verse 5. Now, take into account here, these are hardened sailors. These guys are not sissies. These guys do this for a living. They have seen storm after storm after storm. And the sailors, we learn in verse 5, are afraid. It takes a lot to make a sailor at least show his fear. The sailors are afraid. That's the first thing. And then what do they do? They throw the cargo over. The sailors are used to showing up at port with the cargo. That's how they make their money. Because this wasn't just some easy decision to just throw things over. We'll just go replace it at Walmart. No, this is huge that these guys are this scared. This is a massive storm like they've never seen before. And they do a third thing. The sailors get religious. Now, there are no atheists in foxholes, we hear, and I believe that's true. And there are no atheists as long as there are tests in school because everyone cries out to God at the last minute for help on those things. But these sailors are now visibly calling on any God that might be out there. Uh, Operator, I have a call for any God that might be listening. Please save us. So the sailors are scared. But what is the problem? They've tried everything. What's the weight taking that ship down? Jonah and his sin. And so does my sin, and so does your sin. The sin of Achan there in the Old Testament. Remember when Achan, God said, you defeat them, and you take nothing from the spoil. And when Achan was finally caught and brought before the people and God, he said, I saw it. Okay, we see things, but I looked at it. I didn't just see it and turn away. I looked at it. And I took it. And he says nothing about enjoying it. I took it and I hid it. He immediately knew that he was wrong. And Achan's sin affected the whole nation. Father, our sin affects our family. And it affects those around us. It affects our church. Mothers, our sin affects the family, and those around us in church. Young people, oh, I'm just young. It doesn't matter what we do. It affects those around you and your church. There are fathers who are involved in immorality, and God's chasing you down because your sin is affecting you, and it's affecting your family, and it's affecting your church. There are mothers not in this church, but there are those families who every Sunday they have roast preacher for lunch. And they wonder, why do our kids not like church? Our sin affects all those around us. And so they come, and who is asleep in the middle of all of this? Jonah. Now, why was Jonah asleep? I mean, I don't know. But there are a lot of things that I would speculate. One is it's exhausting 
to rebel against the Lord. It's exhausting to be in opposition to what God's saying to me. He's probably asleep from exhaustion, and there's another reason. He probably wanted to sleep because if he woke up, guess who he had to deal with? God. He woke up. He might be wanting to pray about the storm. God, help us from the storm. But God would say, forget the storm. Let's go back to the first question. God says, there's nothing else more important in your life than going back to what I said and you said no to. So he's asleep. And someone well said, too often we, the church, are asleep while the world perishes. And that hurts, but it's true. So they find him asleep. Why are you asleep? And if all the people on the boat, Jonah should have been the one calling out to God already. And if all the people on the boat, Jonah should have been on a different boat going the opposite direction. And don't you think at this point, Jonah's thinking, this is not working out real good. I've been there. I've been Jonah. And that's exactly what you begin to think. And Jonah's, he's about to make some progress. He's not going to get to the very bottom, literally, until next week. But they wake him up. Why are you asleep? And the, the captain said, call on your God. Our gods haven't listened to us. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. And then they said, let's cast lots. And this is how they're trying to, to find out who it was. And God's not suggesting to us as New Testament believers that we cast lots to find his will. We talked about that last week. But God still superintends this whole process, and God makes sure that the lots fall to Jonah. And so then they hit him in verse 8 with some rapid-fire questions because their lives are on the line. And so they begin to ask him, tell us now, on whose account has this calamity attacked us? What's your occupation? Where are you from? What's your country? What people are you from? What is going on here, man? There's something going on with you, and we're about to die because of it. His sin's affecting them. Oh, I remember I probably told you this, and, and stay with us over the years. I'll tell you the same things over and over and over, and I'll never know uh, as I'm getting older. But uh, when we were in Japan, I'd have a, you know, kind of one of those days where you're feeling like people are giving you a hard time because you're, you're, a, you're a foreigner. And, uh, you know, you just kind of start to get that edge in your voice about something you're wanting a repair done or this or that. And inevitably, they'd say, hey, what do you do here? <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't want to tell them I'm a missionary, you know. I mean, I'm a Mormon, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so here's Jonah. They want to know. And so Jonah begins to tell them, I'm a Hebrew. Okay, he's identifying himself there. He says, I fear the Lord God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. That's a funny way you're fearing God, Jonah. Jonah's theology is paving a way for him to begin to repent and get back to God. So it's good that he believes these. He identifies God exactly for who he is. He uses God's two most intimate favorite names, that he is Yahweh, he is Elohim, and I Fear him. Jonah's sin is affecting everybody around, and so does mine, and so does yours. And today, God would have you just deal with it. There's the devil again. The devil says, as God's Spirit has spoken to you, and God said, that's you. Your sin's affecting others. We read over in Hebrews chapter 12 that bitterness is like a cancer. It's affecting all those around, and God has identified that. You, you know that. I don't know, but you and God know. And the devil's right on his heels saying, but just don't worry about it. Just kick the can down the road. And God says, it's because I love you that I'm identifying this because I just want you right with me. I want to walk closely with you. I want to bless you. So our sin affects us. Our sin affects those around. And then the last thing, it affects God's glory. And that's the biggest of the three. So they ask him these things. He identifies who he is. And in verse 10, they begin to scold him. The lost sailors are going to become Jonah's tutors. They said, they became extremely frightened and said to him, how can you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of God because he told them. And so now they are discipling Jonah because his sin is affecting them and it's affecting the glory of God. 
How can you do this? They're drawing it out of Him. You see, the lost around us want to know about Christ more than we want to tell them. This week I had many opportunities to talk to people about Christ, our prayer, our church, on a helpline. It was interesting. I was on a helpline this week, and I said, you know, there's a long pause, and I thought, you know, the Lord would want you to talk to this man about Christ. I said, where are you from? And he said, oh, southern New Mexico, you know, as if you've never heard of it. And I said, well, your English is really good. Uh, no, I didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> But I felt this pain, you know, there, and uh, so it was interesting. Some of us uh, here in the office were eating lunch, and we, we asked the waitress, hey, how can we pray for you? And instead of saying, leave me alone, which I've never had a waitress or a waiter do that, she said, you know, I'm struggling with anxiety. Could you pray for me? And we were able to talk to her just a little bit, invite her to church, tell her we'd like to talk with her more. Yesterday, the guy roasting my green chilies, first time experience with that, that was exciting been looking forward to that all year long. But the guy roasted my green chilies. He's, we're, we're just sitting there watching the green chilies. Well, he went to ch the church as a child. Says he knows about God. I don't feel like he necessarily is a believer in Christ, inviting him to church. The, the, the lost are just out there. The, the trouble is getting ourselves to talk to them. And most of them want to hear about Christ more than we want to share. Well, Jonah's affecting God's glory here. I mean, here is Jonah. He says, I fear the Lord God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth? And they say, really? Really, you do? Wow. You're a funny God-fearer. What if the folks around me, what if the folks around you found out that you were a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Would they be like the sailors and be surprised? It's a question we should ask ourselves. It's not a fun question. The things we say, the jokes we tell, the words we use, would they be surprised that we're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ? The lost usually have a higher standard for us than we do. Would those around you be surprised you drink when you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? And of course, the clear word there is to not be drunk. So that's easy. I believe the grand picture of the Scripture, as we'll get to another day, warns us to flee because the first step towards getting drunk is the first drink. No other sin in the Scripture does the Word say to us, get real close. The scripture always says, get real far from it. Morality in our lives, are you living in a situation that those around would be saying, wow, you're a believer? And I'm just asking the questions. There are many more questions that we need to ask. It's not about outward holiness. It's not about outward look. But the Scripture says that that is important if it comes from the heart. It's not that it's not important. It's just that it doesn't work if we make it only about the outward. Then we get into legalism. Then we get into facades. But it's a New Testament Scripture that tells us to come out from among them and to be holy. But not to earn salvation not to put up the facade, but so that it's an outgrowth of the heart. It has to start in the heart, or else we get into all kinds of problems. Some things are clear, some things are between you and God, but we need to be pursuing these things, pursuing the things that give God glory, so that our sin is not affecting all of those around you. Friends, God's on mission, and He wants you to be on that mission. See, I'm scared of you every Saturday night. I think that's why I have dreams about church. You're, you're a scary people. Did you know that? But then again, and so is every, every crowd I've ever preached to. It's scary. I was dreaming last night. We were in chairs, and we're going around the chairs. The lost want to hear. God wants us to be on mission with Him. And every one of us needs to surrender to that mission of opening our mouths, starting from wherever you need to start, with a tract, with something, talking to people, praying for the lost around you. And then as they come to Christ, new believers, all of us need a spiritual friend to walk with us like we've been establishing in our one-on-one -on -one discipling ministry. And you need to be a part of that. And some of you have finished discipling each other one-on-one, -on -one and you need another partner. 
until we've all been discipled, even those of us who feel like we don't need it. Even if you don't need it, you're being trained to disciple a new believer. God wants us on mission, and He shows us here with Jonah just how passionate, just what links He'll go to to make sure we're on mission. Because if we're not, we're stealing His glory, and we're stealing our joy. Because that's the only place you're ever going to be having joy. In fact, one of the greatest ways to snap yourself out of a funk when you're either seriously depressed or having a rough moment is to just ask the question, how can I glorify God? It'll take your focus off you and put it back on God and on His glory. But finally, there are always two ships waiting for you, a ship to Nineveh and a ship to Tarshish. And you've got to choose. And even if you get on the ship to Tarshish, which we all do sometimes, call out to God, repent, and He'll let you get back on the ship to Nineveh. God cannot be hidden and we cannot hide from him, and that's a good thing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this story of Jonah. And Lord, I feel about 16,000 fingers pointed at me this morning as I looked at this story, and, and I just want to ask you to work in my life, that I would give you glory, that I would say yes to you, that I would not have my own way and go my own way, but I would surrender to your word as you make your will clear to me, that I would have short accounts with you and be right with you, and I pray that for all of us, Lord. We're all at different places this morning. Lord, you know what needs to happen today. But there are those who need to come and say, I want to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. God, help them to have the wisdom to come today. There are those who have, fought, who have come to know you but need to follow you in believer's baptism to go public about that. Help them today to say, yes, I'll do that. I'll follow the example we saw today. And then, Lord, there are a myriad of other things that you're laying on our hearts today. Help us to say yes. Help us to come fill the altar on our knees in surrender to you, uh, dealing with you where we're at, taking concrete steps to say yes to God, to get off the ship to Tarshish and get on the ship to Nineveh. Thank you that there's no sin so great the cross won't pay for it. Help us to surrender to you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's